a world-renowned humanitarian and pastor. Pastor Keon Henderson knew who his biological father was. The problem, he was never acknowledged as his son. First of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be. You have had uh, an amazing career. I want to talk a little bit uh, about that and the amazing things that you were able to do as a pastor. When you look at your accomplishments, let's talk about uh, the Lighthouse Church there uh, in Houston. When you look at the Lighthouse, it's doing two services now? In one of the locations. In, in, in one other location. Yeah, so we've got uh, three locations total that are coming, four all together. So it's two in Humble, one in Katy, one in Sugar Land, and one downtown. That's amazing. Over the last, that all happened over the last seven years? Uh, yes. Last yeah. seven years, and the three newest locations have happened all in the last six months. And you're 33, seven. 37, yes. 37 years old. Do you ever have to pinch yourself? Um, I've got a mentor who has taught me to <laughs> pinch myself uh, recently because historically I've not paid attention to accomplishments. Mm -hmm. um, and I just recently found out why. Um, I really have spent the majority of my life living in two locations, either past or future. Mm -hmm. uh, very rarely have I ever lived in the present. Mm -hmm. um, then recently I read something that said uh, that the ego can only survive in the past or the future. And it doesn't survive in the present. And um, I wondered whether it was false humility, whether it was fear insecurity, rejection, and then I recognized that it was a composition of it all. And then one day, um, you <laughs> mm -hmm. told me to uh, slow down and recognize how far I'd come, mm -hmm. and then to uh, use you as a marker and mm -hmm. enjoy the distance. Mm -hmm. um, instituting those two realities has helped me to really realize how far I've come, um, and then looking at you, tells me how far I've got to go. <laughs> you know, when, when, you, when you, you said something that was really profound about either living in the past or the future and not the present and that ego only survives either in yesterday or tomorrow, not, not in today, I think that's a very, very interesting uh, a concept. On one hand, when you look at the future, uh, it is always in front of you. It looks optimistic. It looks... Uh, sometimes intimidating, uh, it looks exciting. Uh, is, is that the egotistical part of it, that, that, that I'm gonna end up here? Is that why ego lives in the future, because it designs the future according to its own vision? Yeah, so, you know, the majority of individuals would define ego as arrogance. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard one person say ego is simply more than an acronym for edging God out. Mm -hmm. And so when I speak of ego, I'm, I'm eliminating uh, the probability that God had worked these things together for my good or uh, that why did I have to go through that? You know, mm -hmm. questioning the process, mm -hmm. uh, which is egotistical in, 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 a, in a sort of way. And uh, I'd, I'd have to be honest, um, that, that anger, that, that drive, uh, however you define it, it helped me in sports mm -hmm. uh, as I played basketball growing up. It helped me in football and basketball. Didn't serve me as well in ministry because it wasn't a competition. So to a degree, it is the vicissitudes of the past that gave you the drive to go into the future. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I've, got a, I've got a lot of nuggets back there, a lot of anger, a lot of history. I uh, had the pleasure of uh, seeing you speak with Max Cato not too long ago and uh, you, he had asked you about your pain and, mm -hmm. and thinking that because you're this awesome character, he says, uh, what, why, why were you not bitter? And you said, I passed by there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had these places that I passed by on the way here. Number one, uh, being born to a mother uh, who worked at Taco Bell, making $7 an hour, raising four children, living up the street from a father who pastored an enormous church and drove brand new cars every two years. Let's talk about that. I, I want to get down into that because uh, this this is really about, you, you, you're just 
a perfect example of, of what I wrote about when I wrote Crushing because a lot of people would see you now and they would see your success and they see your multi-site locations. They would see you uh, commanding the pulpit with authority and power and, and, and all types of people following you. Uh, your leadership at, at such a young age. So if you're talking, uh, you're 38 now and you've been doing it for the last seven years, so from 31 years old till now, you have been welding the pulpit in such a way that you have amassed uh, thousands and thousands of people, uh, some from the very upper echelon of Houston, uh, right down to grassroots people look to you as pastor for direction, for guidance. They would never think that you had come from a time in your life of, of peril. 25% of millennials were born in single parent homes. So that's, uh, and particularly wow. single parent homes with mothers, single mothers raising children. Your mother was raising four, working at Taco Bell, minimum wage, four kids, barely getting by, a little bit of money. Uh, I've seen the pictures of the house. It's a, a substandard housing. Uh, all the odds are stacked against you. You should you should have been a drug dealer. You should have ended up in prison. You should. I passed by there. <laughs> <laughs> you passed by I there. I passed by there. Yeah, that's 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 good. That's good. That's good to know. So so you were seeking options, trying trying to fill a gap, because because you were exposed to church early. Yeah. Okay, and served in the church. Mm -hmm and served your pastor. Yes, sir. You were his adjutant. Yes, sir. Uh, how long was it in your life that you served as a, just purely as an adjutant without any understanding that you were related to him? Oh, my goodness. Well, that, that's, <laughs> it's, it's a loaded answer because I served him all the way until I got my first, as a, my first assignment. So I found out he was my father at 12. Okay, so um, I wasn't Let's really Let's stop certain. right there because a lot of people uh, just gasp. <laughs> okay. You served a pastor as an adjutant, and at 12 years old, you found out that your pastor was your father. Yes, sir. How did you find out? Well, um, there was an event at school, um, and it was a father-son event called Dads and Donuts, and um, went to the event and saw all of the dads there. Mm -hmm. And just decided to go home and ask my mother one day, who is my father? And I went home and I asked her, and she looked at me and she paused. And I know her, I know mm -hmm. my mama. Mm -hmm. I know her, I know her, I can see her sitting here and she's a hundred miles away, but I know her. And I knew something was wrong mm -hmm. and after what seemed to be an hour, which was probably 10 seconds, mm -hmm. she says, Dr. Brooks is your father. All of my siblings are in the room at the time. They say nothing. I ran out of the room screaming because for every year that I could remember, I used to pray and wish he was my father because he was this quintessential example of what a father should be. I saw him taking care of his other children. I saw him building a ministry. I saw him amassing wealth. I saw him building apartments for the less fortunate community development corporations. He was a multi-site church in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so wow. I saw this growing up and the moment I found out, honor became hatred. Um, Why? because I couldn't figure out how he could tell everybody every Sunday what they needed to do with their families. And I witnessed him not do any of that for me. And I got angry. And so I asked her, could I confront him? And she said, yes. I went to church. Um, he um, used to shake hands down at the bottom of the pulpit, the old Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And I went down there and got in line and waited on my turn to shake the pastor's hand, and I asked him, I said, can I ask you a question when nobody's around? He said, sure, as I was his little guy. I mean, he, I could see now that he had preferential treatment for me, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what all of that was. Mm -hmm. And so we went out into the fellowship hall, and I looked him in his eyes like I'm looking at you, and I said, are you my father? He said, yes. 
I said, when were you going to tell me? He said, eventually. I didn't know what eventually meant. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant. And so I said, do you mind if we set up an opportunity to speak? He said, yes, that was on a Sunday. He decided Wednesday would be good. He had a Jeep Cherokee. I never will forget. Um, he picked me up from my house, 204 West 15th Avenue, picked me up from my mother's apartment, put me in the car. We started driving down the street and I had a list of 12 questions. And I asked him the first question. Um, the first question was- Before you tell me what yes. the first question was, how does it feel riding in the car, anticipating a conversation that is so important to you and totally uncertain of what the answer might be? What, what, what were you feeling? I was nervous, uh, very tactful to ensure that I would present myself as a son that you could be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that I made no mistakes so that way when this conversation is over, you would grab me and you would take me back to that church and that you would tell everybody, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. I anticipated. You had a vision I of how it was gonna go. I did. It didn't go that way. Uh, he died in January of last year and it still never happened. He never acknowledged you? No. When you tell me what the first question was. Um, am I as good as your other sons? Wow. So you felt like his denial at that point was your fault, like maybe you, maybe he was ashamed of you. Yeah, because he was married when I was born mm -hmm. and my mother was a member of the church. Mm -hmm. And my mother was the only child at that time who had had children out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. So she was a black sheep. She was the only woman who had had it. Only, yeah. yeah, only woman in the family. And everybody else was married and everybody else was upward mobile and doing all of this stuff. And here my mother is, no education, two children by the pastor of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a hard thing. How did that translate into am I as good? I, I'm just awed by the first question. We've never talked about that. No, um, it, it sounds like to me you question your value or his value of you. Yeah. Uh, how did he respond? He, he responded by making a U-turn and dropping me back, back off at the house and telling me that I was going to upset him before he had to teach Bible study. He never answered the question. I got out of the car and went back in the house. Wow. So the vision is shattered. It so am I. Yeah, and you're shattered. Yeah. Crushed. Crushed. You go back in the house. And how did that make you feel about yourself? What I initially felt uh, was a responsibility for my mother because she warned me. Mm -hmm. So I spent all of this time pursuing somebody who was absent, overlooking the woman who was present. Mm -hmm. And she warned me that it would end that way. She told me, you're not going to get anything out of that. But I pursued it because I thought I would be persuasive enough, present myself enough. See, I've got brothers that are athletes. One brother's an athlete, so I know my dad's, a, he played semi-pro football. You love athletes. Mm -hmm. Dad, I scored 12 points last game. That's what the origination of the question was. Am I good enough? Because he coached my brother's football team, but he had never come to one of my games. So you associated performance with acceptance. Yeah. And maybe still do um, if I dig deep down in there. Wow. Um, even your performance to me mm -hmm. uh, says that what I did mattered. Um, that my life is still very much performance-based. Um, I didn't have any feelings um, about him initially. It was about my mother. After we had our talk and everything calmed down, I went back to being mad at him. Mm. I didn't realize until 
I was this age that I needed to have more grace for him than I did before I arrived here. So is some of that feeling of, of confusion brought about by this is like your superhero. Your servant, there's a special bond between an adjutant and a pastor. I mean, the only guys who are good at that, the only way you can be a good adjutant is that you love the pastor. You, you absolutely have to love him or it doesn't work. Yeah. So you love him and then you find out this, this object of your adoration is your father. I mean, your dream came true. You asked, you know, I wish he was my dad. And, and, and now you have this conversation and he takes you, he turns the car around, drives you back home, drops you off and says, uh, you're going to upset me before I have to preach. As if that were more important than you. Again. Again. Something else is more important than yeah. me. Again. So you got crushed again. What was it like? Because you didn't leave that church. Your mother didn't leave that church. No. Um, your sister didn't leave that church. No, sir. And, and we haven't even talked about that she was also his child. Um, how could you sit there? <laughs> I, I admired him as a pastor. I don't know what it is about the way my mind works. Um, but I admired him as a pastor so much and the hope that one day we could reconcile, I learned to just wait. Mm -hmm. um, I hoped that every time he would sweat and I would wipe it off of the back of his head or if I got him the Gatorade that he used to drink afterwards or the Ricola that he would put in his mouth uh, because he had a very raspy voice or whether it would be to put his cape on because he used to wear robes right. and uh, I would put the cape over his shoulder and I would tuck a towel inside of the robe and put the cape on and, and lasso the chain. I just mm -hmm. hoped that one day I would serve him until he accepted me. And um, he started to do little things. Um, I started preaching at 14. He let me preach my first sermon 10 minutes before he preached that Sunday. Mm. which is something I saw him do with my brothers. And then he would say this to me, which I really didn't know how to take. Whenever it would, uh, he would say something about how proud he was of his sons. Mm. He would come to me after church and whisper in my ear and say, you know, I was talking about you. Wow. And um, so I learned to survive on those broken pieces. That's funny because that's the kind of thing that a man says to a girlfriend. You know, you know, uh, chick on the side, you know, you know, I was thinking about you. So, so he's feeding you this line and you're getting the scraps that fall from the table. Uh, when you speak of your brothers, you're talking about his sons that he acknowledged. Yes. Growing up in a traditional Baptist church, the, the first family has a lot of perks yeah. and you know they we honor the first family and we're going to do this for the first family and we're going to have the first family to stand and we're going to have the first family to come in but you never got to stand you never got to be acknowledged and still you serve what is interesting to me is that in the back of your mind you you thought maybe one day i'll do something good enough that he'll accept me. That's a lot of pain. Uh, how did that crushing, that denial, that rejection push you forward? Well, first of all, let me just say my mother was incredible in balancing what should have happened to me and what did. She was instrumental in keeping my mind Focus. She would look at me and she'd say, son, remember, people don't have to be nice. And when they decide to be nice, they don't have to be nice to you. She would affirm me, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. He'll be sorry one day, you just see. She would just, I, and I, I would feed off of those things. And I think she cried enough for the both of us <laughs> <laughs> um, to answer the question, how? Mm -hmm. 
A defining moment for me was the day that I stopped expecting that it would be. My oldest brother dies. Mm -hmm. um, he dies at 89 pounds. This is his son? His son. Okay. So this is your older brother, brother. secretly? Yeah. Who knows that I'm his brother, who lets me spend a night at the house as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, treats me. So what God had done is he had given me some tentacles into my family, even mm -hmm. though I didn't get to go all the way in there, I had some connections. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've got my brother who knows that I'm his brother and he, whether actually or just facade, would be upset with me mm -hmm. at his house about my father not taking care of me, but he would do it. So mm -hmm. I drove my brother's car to the prom. Okay. okay. Oh wow. So I've got I've got these tentacles that I'm connected to. And and by the way, his name is Cato Brooks, like my father. So my father's a junior, he's a third. Looks just like him. Um he dies. I don't know if it hurt me more than it hurt anybody else because my only connection to this larger than life personality is him. And my brother's gone. And we come to the funeral. And I'm in college playing basketball and I get the call that he's died. And I get in my car and I drive back. It's a foggy night, one o'clock in the morning. I drive all the way back home in my 1996 Buick Regal. It's turquoise, <laughs> exterior, gray interior, dual climate control. <laughs> I can see it. I mean, you describe it so good, I can see it. I drive, I get there, days pass, funeral comes. And the family is on one side and the community is on the other. And I'm sitting on the side with the community. And that day I said, enough is enough. I, I either have to separate from the expectation that this will come, or I'm going to have a disdain in my heart so deep that I don't know if it'll ever be able to come out. The hope itself is torture. The hope is torture. You know, in your book, Crushing, mm -hmm. you talked about how, how the, the final form isn't the bruised grape mm -hmm. and how it's th the grape is crushed. Mm -hmm. When I read that, the Holy Spirit said to me, yeah, the grape is crushed, but the wine expands mm -hmm. and it only does it in skin. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself when I read that, that somehow I was modeling that process. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that not having my father and being on Section 8 and eating government cheese and not having transportation and seeing my mother walk to Ivy Tech to try to get a bachelor's degree so she could get a better job and be the manager of Taco Bell, which she did, mm -hmm. became the manager and hired all of her children. And now we're all working at Taco, <laughs> Bell, Taco Bell. And she goes and becomes the regional manager. Wow. Uh, that's, that's who she was. Fighter. A fighter. Mm -hmm. A fighter. And I didn't know that that's what that was. Mm -hmm. um, but at that funeral, enough was enough. And I quit hoping for it so much so that he and I got into a fight. Uh, he tried to tell me, see, I got married when I was 21. Mm -hmm. When I think about why I did that, it was one statement she said to me that stuck out. She says, I'm going to fill the hole that your father never did. And I must have fell in love with that statement. Wow. And I married a woman 10 years older than me. Wow. Um, at the age of 21 and searching for that, mm -hmm. right? And um, I invited him to the wedding and he went off on me on the phone. You don't have any business marrying a woman that's da 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 and I think I would have walked away from ever marrying that woman if he would not have been against it. Uh. I, I, I know now that I went in full force because Def he was against it. Defiance. Defiance. Yeah. And he went off on me on the phone and he told me that he would get in the car and that he would come to Houston and he would take his belt off and that he would whoop me like I was a child. And I said, bring it on because you're going to get here and you're going to find out I ain't little and I'm going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And he never came. All I was trying to get him to do was come. I said everything wrong that a son is not supposed to say to a father to get him mad enough to come. 
And all I was rehearsing, if he actually would have came and said, you can do whatever you want to do to me, you came. He could have beat me into the ground, but he came. And he never came. And um, just like he had never come before. Wow. So you went through with the wedding? Went through the wedding, filed for divorce six months later. <laughs> <laughs> so he was right. He was right. <laughs> He was right. Oh, he was so right. He was right then and he's right now. Um, you, you, you know, the funny thing, because I think this is a teachable moment, because so many men try to apply discipline where they have not applied love. And to step into a child's life with correction when you have never stepped into their life with nurture and self-esteem, I think that, that it's like building a floor without floor joists your authority has nothing to stand on because you have no history with the child. Yeah. And but you purposely made him angry because you wanted him to be angry enough to care about you enough to get in the car. Because he had a temper. Mm -hmm. I, I I seen him break two by fours with his hand. I, I seen him punch holes in the wall after staff meetings. I, I saw him I remember a homeless guy came to the church and asked him for two dollars and he gave it to him. And then the guy came back. I'm his adjutant, right? Mm -hmm. he had, you remember, the, well, you remember this briefcase used to be hard and they had the, oh, yes. the numbers on them and used to oh, click yes. them. He used to carry one of those. And the, the homeless guy came and asked for the $2. He gave it to him. He said, but only if you come to church Sunday. Mm -hmm. Homeless man didn't come to church Sunday. He came back that Wednesday at Bible study and asked for two more dollars. And, um, and my father wouldn't give it to him. Mm -hmm. And the guy yelled back in the church, you fake preacher. And I saw my daddy dart after him mm -hmm. and he was I was grabbing on the back of his suit jacket <laughs> it was a green suit jacket with yellow pants I'm grabbing on him <laughs> trying to keep him from going out there because I saw anger always prompt a reaction mm -hmm. again I'm saying anger makes you respond to everything else but me what is it uh, here we, back to the crushing what is it about me where I can't get a response mm -hmm. respond some kind of way say something do something um, never happened. Well, it did happen at the end. Uh, I'm sure uh, you'll probably ask me a parting question mm -hmm. and I can tell you how it ended, but something did happen eventually. You know, when you, when you look at those crushing moments, in the book I talk about the crushings are the catalyst to your future and to your destiny. They drive you forward. They either drive you down or they drive you forward. Mm -hmm. Some people it drives them down into the ground. Other people it drives them forward. Why didn't you go down? Yeah, my mom was like yours, um, extremely poetic in speech. Mm -hmm. um, even though she wasn't educated, she wasn't a dumb woman. She mm -hmm. isn't a dumb woman. She always talked to me uh, with the highest regard of language. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, you know, Keon, most people don't have enough presence to dissolve the past. Mm -hmm. And she would always tell wow. me, stay present, <laughs> stay, stay present. present, stay present, stay present. She says, son, you can never be angry if you stay present. Mm -hmm. The only time you're going to be angry is if you go back in the past, mm -hmm. stay present. I, she drilled that in me and I made it a habit to stay present. Mm -hmm. It's, it was such, um, an insurmountable effort, but I did it and it got me favored with all kinds of people. Even my basketball mm -hmm. coach who just called me the other day, he lives in Las Vegas. He wants to come to Houston and hear me preach. Um, he told me, I've coached guys who are in the NBA. I've coached guys who have gone all over the world to play basketball, but you're my favorite player because you would listen. Mm -hmm. I just stay present, whether I was playing basketball, whether I'm listening to you, uh, whether I'm raising my children, whether I'm, I, I've just learned to stay present. It's the only way I survived. One of the things I did is uh, back in those days, we had Walkmans and I, um, I had a set of headphones that I got from the Harbor Food Center mm -hmm. and I spent a dollar on a cassette tape, didn't even know at this time who this guy named Sam Cooke was. <laughs> and he had this song and I just recorded it on my album, A Change Gonna Come. Mm -hmm. I used to listen to that song every day. Wow. And my mother would come in there and she would say, if you keep falling asleep with that Walkman on your neck, that cord is gonna <laughs> choke you and I ain't gonna wake you up. Mm -hmm. um, the song ministered to me. It was my mentor. Yeah, one day a change is gonna one come. One day a change is gonna come. You're in the car with me. Let's fast forward. Mm. Now you're going to make me cry because I... 
<laughs> All right. Go ahead. We're going to do that. All right. <laughs> um, I, I kind of became the surrogate father. Um, and you're in the Can car. Can I tell you, do yeah. you know what car we were in? No, too. Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was just hoping you'd make a U-turn. <laughs> I, I was like, don't make a U-turn. The last time I was in one of these, it didn't work out right. <laughs> it didn't go too good. I'm in the car with you, and, and, and I'm pulling up the ramp near where my house was, and, and I decided to confront the way you processed what happened between you and your father as being your fault. Yeah. And I'm trying to make you understand that it was his problem, it was not your fault. And, and I'm playing it back to you from his perspective, his fear, his failure, his gross negligence, <clears throat> his insecurity, his, his trap between his wife, his church, his image, and, and his weaknesses. What was that like for you when I was telling you that? The thing that came over my mind at that moment was if I had to go back into my mother's womb and be reborn, and have the same set of circumstances to get to this moment, I swear I would do it again. You approached me with a tender care that I had never felt from a man in my life. I've been loved by my mother, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what that was. Here I am in the car with the greatest preacher that has ever lived. <laughs> who has enough time for the guy that the other guy wouldn't come up the street for. Why me? You got three sons, two daughters, two million members, <laughs> 17,000 <laughs> 17, spiritual children, 16 conferences, 82 businesses. <laughs> and here I am listening to you tell me how I needed to process it. Well, I can swallow that because you've put the equity in. You've, you've already built the floor joist. Prior to that conversation, you've critiqued my preaching. You have, um, you have critiqued my leadership skill. You've affirmed me where I needed to be affirmed. You have chastised me where I needed to be chastised. You've, you've, you've done all of this construction work and now I trust you to bulldoze this sacred cow that I've been holding on to. I had no anxiety, no hesitation, confusion, mm -hmm. because I didn't think you were right, mm -hmm. because you didn't know the whole story. Mm -hmm. But you are absolutely right. And here I am, a, a young, a late 20 some early 30 something, and you're telling me that. Mm -hmm. And your words to me were, you won't recognize the decisions that he had to make until you are in his position. Mm -hmm. And now I am close to the age that my father was when I was born. Mm -hmm. And I understand exactly why he never got in front of that microphone and told that church <laughs> who I was. Um, you and, helped it, me that. and it wasn't about your performance and it wasn't whether you did good on the basketball court. It wasn't about whether you preached well, it was about his own struggles inside of himself. Um, and, and there in the car, you wept. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when you told me that you would go back into your mother's womb and go through all of that again, just to have me in your life, uh, that brought tears up in me. That was an awfully high price to pay to finally get a father, but to value a surrogate father that much was overwhelming. So what, what you didn't know is that at 12, 
the situation when my biological father happens. My mother hands me a book that I still have, and she gives it to me, and on the cover of it, it's a father and his little son. And she told me to start writing in it. She told me to write what I cared about, write what I thought, write what I wanted, write my dreams. And she told me to do that. And I make this list of things that I want. And as early as 14, I write in this book. I have the book still to this day. It's falling apart. It's, it's over 25 years old. I will be a trusted son of Bishop T.D. Jakes. And my mother would come into the room and pray that with me every day. So this is, this is 15 to 17 years before I ever lay eyes on you. I had the book on me the first day I ever met you. Um, I still have it to this day. I will lose a lot of things. That book, I will never part with. Um, she gave it to me. And in a sense gave me you before you knew I existed because she and I united our prayers and hope that this day will come, and it did. So that day you saw a young man in the car that had a walking start or a running start. You didn't know I was in a bullet train coming in your direction, <laughs> and so much steam and momentum was built behind that moment that you were not privy to, that being there, those emotions, I wasn't crying about my father. It wasn't him that I cried about. I cried because I finally found a place where I could lay the weight aside. It was relief. Finally. Finally, I get to have this conversation. The one that I tried to provoke him to have. Mm -hmm. The one that I prayed that we would have. It's here. And uh, I'm grateful for it. I, I thought that uh That, that God had called me into your life to fill in the gaps, uh, to show you that you mattered, uh, uh, to invest the energy that should have been there. I never will forget going shopping with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought you some... Uh, some fatigue pants, uh, yeah, true religion. Yeah, true religion. Yeah. <laughs> and you were standing there like you were 12 years old and just grinning. Uh, and I knew in that moment without you ever mm. even saying that, that you'd never had a father take you shopping. Yeah. I got, I have everything you ever bought me. <laughs> when I want to preach good, I buy these shoes. You you bought me these, uh, these Prada shoes. They were silver and black. When I want to preach good, I put them on. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I brought a, a, a stylist to the house and he, uh, you know, did a closet clean mm -hmm. and took everything out of the closet because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Came to that closet and those shoes were not in there. I went through all of those bags, <laughs> pulled those shoes out and said, these shoes are staying. Um, yeah, I, uh, you gave me what I was missing. No strings attached. Right. No strings attached. Um, no, uh, no desire or ask of reciprocity. No. Uh, you and I got into almost an argument at the cash rush. I'm like, no, Bishop, you can't buy me anything uh, because I didn't know that that was okay, you know? I had to buy it for you because I looked at your face and I knew I had never seen you look so happy. And, <laughs> and, and I knew it was a fantasy fulfilled to go shopping with your dad. And then if I like, let you buy it, it would have ruined the fantasy. Yeah. So I had to buy it like I was getting you ready for back to school, <laughs> you know, so, so that you could, <laughs> you could have that moment and that yeah. feeling was, was very important between the two of us. Yeah. And, and, and I promised you and I prayed for that you would have a reckoning day with your father and you did. I did. Uh, you get the call that he's fading away and you travel to see him. You go in the house with his wife. Mm -hmm. You go in the room where he is fading fast. This is the last chance to reconcile. You can't drive away this time. <laughs> what did you say to him? Uh, he was eating. Um, 
my first words to him was, do you need any help? And for the first time, he said yes. So I got a napkin and I put it in the shirt and uh, he ate and I still can see it because he couldn't stand up. So he had the kind of chair where you push a button and the chair lifts you up to a standing position. Mm -hmm. He got exhausted eating. So in his underwear, I walk him to his bedroom, which is up two steps and to the right and the left. Walk him around his bed. I lay him in the bed, pull the covers over him. And for the first time, I'm in the bed with my father at the same time. And I laid in his bed and he began to talk to me. And he told me that I was his prized possession and that he was too weak of a man to tell the truth. And I asked him if it was okay if I recorded this on my phone because I knew this would be one of the last times I heard his voice and he said yes and I have this 45 minute conversation broken up into four segments of 10 on my cell phone right now. And he said, I wish I was a strong enough man to come and rescue you from the pain. And he said, I just didn't have it. Um, I would have lost the church and my wife and I didn't know how to choose you over all of that. And I understand that now. Which is exactly what I told you was what Which is was what you out. told me behind it the whole time. Mm -hmm. You called it a trap that he was in. And he explained the trap to me piece by piece. And how are you feeling at that moment? Happy. Really? I'm happy. Because? Because he was tired. And he wanted to live. I know he wanted to live. But I know he was okay if that was it. He was 77 years old. He was older when I was born. So I'm happy at the time he's telling me that. Then he falls asleep while he's talking to me. And happiness turns into fear because I cannot escape my imagination at that moment that I'm looking at him sleep. And I said to myself, it won't be long before I see that face again in that position. I just knew that that was it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew I would never see him alive again. You loved him. With everything in me. I, I never loved somebody I hated so much. <laughs> <laughs> I loved him till he took his last breath. I FaceTimed him when he went to the hospital and didn't even know who I was. He didn't recognize me. Um, but I knew him. And he died and then they brought him back. And he lasted another few days and I got a chance to see him on the phone again and at this time they're just showing me him, and there is really no life in him. And Miles Monroe said something that I have had the privilege of knowing before that moment. He says, you should visit your pain in your mind so you're not shocked when you get there. Mm. And I visited his death so many times in those days in between that when he took his last breath, it was well with my soul because I had done everything that I could have done for him, to him and with him. I had no regrets and I left no stone unturned. You did all of that for him and to him and with him and got nothing in return to speak of. And yet we see so many people who have everything you ever dreamed of who take it all for granted. And when you see those sons, what do you want to say to them? 
if you live long enough, you will have to confront the reality behind every decision you're upset with. And that it is so easy to see another's faults, but the real reality of life and the maturity of it is when you're able to see your own. I would say to every son who has everything they want and somehow don't have the veracity to be respectful or to be honorable, that if you live long enough, you will regret that because life will present you with a set of circumstances where somebody has to make a decision about how they feel about you. Um, and it would be in all our best interest to not just make our decisions based on those situations that hurt us and those people who are leaving us, but to realize that your path will eventually lead this same way. My favorite quote is, you're born looking like your parents, but you die looking like your decisions. Wow. I'd rather focus on my choices. One of the hardest things in, 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 in mentoring you for me was when he died. Because everything in me wanted to be at that funeral. But I knew if I came in that funeral, I would have to have remarks. And I couldn't think of anything to say that didn't include you. And I knew I couldn't say what I wanted to say about you. And you went to that funeral and I was worried about you. Because once again, you were not with the family. Did you get closer? I don't know. You have it now? I do now. What gave it? Um, I came to your house a few weeks after the funeral was over. Mm -hmm. And my wife, you remember she fell asleep on your uh, yeah, dude. on your chair? Yeah. And you and I talked for hours. And I cried again. And but that day you didn't you didn't meet me with that emotion that you had in previous times. Mm -hmm. It was like it was one of those moments. It was like, all right, son, shake it off. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward, let's process the pain, and let's tell the story. I left your house and I went to preach in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling you at their afternoon, which was your morning, <laughs> and you still answer the phone. I got a release preaching that day. I told the story for the first time, and I let it out, and the whole church was at the altar, and I was leaning up against Pastor Bill Dooms uh, at Coase. I was leaning up against his LED screen crying. <laughs> and he's standing on the front row looking at me. And I was like, ah, oh, this is it. I'm released, God. I, I, I'm, I knew that I had closure when I could tell the story mm -hmm. and not feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. And I got it in the motherland. It was oh, in wow. that preaching moment that I felt like, whew, it's all over, and it was around my birthday in July of uh, about two years ago, and that's when I that's when I got the closure. Wow! A year ago, I should say. I'm sorry. The son who wiped the sweat off the head of a man that he could never acknowledge as his father, though he was the son who climbed up in the bed with the man that was dying to finally hear something that he should have heard when he was a child, is now preaching all over the world. Is is now pastoring multiple sites, uh, is now owning his own businesses. You have your own companies. You have carved out your own future. You have done what a lot of men have not done at 50 and 60. Do you recognize 
that the very thing that made life so horrible is also the very thing that pushed you forward. Absolutely, I do now. I absolutely know that now. Yeah, it was good that I was afflicted. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely know it now. And I absolutely, um, I revel in the fact of how God works mm -hmm. in that crushing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember you um, standing on the stage one day with grapes in your hand mm -hmm. yeah. and you were squeezing them and, and, and the, the, juice. the juice was running down your hands. And I remember, you know, because all of us brothers, spiritual brothers, uh, we cry every time you speak. And uh, we were looking at each other and we were saying, that's us. Yeah. Both the grapes and the juice in your hand. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely know that that pressure uh, makes me precious. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, one of the things I also learned is that isolation often leads to invitation. Mm -hmm that it was the donkey that had never been ridden that Jesus got on the mm -hmm. on Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was the son that was in the field that wasn't in the lineup. Right. Um, my invitations from you and from your friends and from life and the, the, the consequences of that um, roll full of hell and high water, um, I now enjoy the benefits of my bruises. And somebody did drop me, mm -hmm. um, but um, my story doesn't end like my field chef. Somebody also picked me up, and um, I'm eternally grateful to you for all that you have invested in my life. My children, my wife, my family will forever uh, be hedged and protected and provided for because of the tools that you have taught me. And um, my hope is that the wine that has come out of my crushing, that while you have breath in your body, I can present you with a bottle of it um, so that you can enjoy what you poured into me. Wow. Wow. You took me aback with that. <laughs> as, as we come to the close of this interview, I just recently went down to your church to preach. <laughs> Is that what you call that? <laughs> it was. It wasn't preaching. I don't know what that was. Uh, I wish I could have rented the Reliance Stadium. It, it needed to be 80,000 people there. Mm. It, was, it, was a, it was a moment that went around the world. Yeah. I've gotten calls from Australia and Africa and, and London. People streamed all over the world that moment. Um, it was a compilation of vulnerability and the word of God and revelation. But to have you there, to have you in the house, oh man, that was, that was a joy. That was amazing. You are a joy. Thank you. And you are amazing. Thank you, sir. And I am so proud of you. I am so very proud. I'm proud of what you've done with your life. I'm proud of how you rose above the vicissitudes of your past. I'm proud of how you have given back to people over top of your pain. I'm proud of how you raise your children. I'm proud of how you hold your marriage together. I'm proud of how you take care of your mother. I'm proud of how you live I'm proud of how you love. I'm just simply proud of you. And that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It might have come late, but it did come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this life that for whatever reason, you saw fit to bruise and to crush and even to allow it to be stomped up under feet that you might make the wine that would shake nations. A great price has been paid. It always is. Greatness never goes on sale. It's never discounted. It's never a two for one. 
you have to pay full price. Just like you did when you died on the cross. You paid it all. <laughs> I thank you for this young man. I thank you for the price he paid, the appreciation that he garnered, the effects that he's had, and the future that lays before him. It's all because, crushed or not, you never let go of his hand. Thank you, Jesus. Continue to hold him in your hand. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Wow. Amazing.